Hey, how's it going everyone? Uh, my name is Troy Squalachi. Um, this video is going to be for people who are familiar with programming but have not programmed in Python before. Um, it's going to be a short introductory video where we implement uh, as a case study a very simple genetic algorithm. Um, and we're going to be taking advantage of and demonstrating several different um, paradigms within Python. Uh, Python is a multi-paradigm language, so uh, in this particular demo I'm going to be demonstrating object-oriented programming, imperative programming, and functional programming all in one file. Um, the editor I'm going to be using for the demo today is going to be Atom, so you can see here I'm starting off on the command line. Um, before I actually open up the file and start editing a file, uh, the first thing we need to do is download a dependency off of PyPy that we're going to be using in this genetic algorithm. And if you remember off of the slides uh, during my pre presentation, um, you end up using a utility on the command line called pip to interact with PyPy. Um, additionally, uh, it's a good idea typically when you're writing Python code to containerize everything inside of a virtual environment. Uh, this doesn't matter what version of Python you're using, it's typically a good idea to do this. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a virtual environment for this example. So I'm going to say make virtual environment and I'm just going to give it a name. Um, I'm just going to say simple GA. So you can see it's installing Python and installing some of the base packages which are setup tools pip and wheel. Um, now that we have uh, the virtual environment done, the next thing we're going to want to do is actually enable the virtual environment. We need to get into it. So the way we do that is we say work on and then the name of the environment. So it's going to be simple GA. So now we're in Simple GA, and the way that you can verify that you're in Simple GA after you've made a new virtual environment is to show all of the currently installed Python packages within the virtual environment. And the way you do that is you do pip freeze. And this version of pip is outdated. It's saying that we can update it if we want. Um, I'm not going to do that here, but you can see that we have essentially nothing installed except for wheel, which is always installed whenever you make a new virtual environment. So now that we're in this virtual environment, um, I'm going to install that dependency that I mentioned before. And this dependency is called fuzzy wuzzy. So I'm going to say pip install fuzzy wuzzy. And what fuzzy wuzzy does is it is a fuzzy string matching um, package. So it, it performs essentially um, fuzzy, it uses fuzzy logic to um, come up with degrees of truth rather than just true and false. And uh, the reason we need degrees of true and false is because we're dealing with a genetic algorithm which inherently is concerned with optimization. You can't have just all true, all false. You have to have some way to partially um, say that an answer is correct or not. Uh, anyway, if I do pip freeze again, you'll see that we have fuzzy was installed. So at this point, we have everything we need to actually start developing the Python code. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up Atom, and I'm just going to open up a file called simpleGA.py. And you'll see Atom is going to launch here. Just going to take one moment. Um, this is showing an entire uh, directory structure on the left um, for my home directory because that's where we're working. We're not really concerned with this. Um, I have some other um, packages installed within Atom as well that show various things. Your Atom might look different than mine if you are developing an Atom, but by no means do you have to develop an Atom. So at this point we could start actually writing the code and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the code one line at a time and I'm going to explain kind of what it means and the paradigm that it's following. Uh, and then when we're done we'll give it a, a test and uh, we'll see if it works. So the first thing you want to do often in many Python programs is uh, import packages that you're going to be using. So 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to import two packages that I know we're going to be using for sure. So I'm going to say import random, which is going to be used for random number generation. And I'm also going to import uh, string. Now, you don't have to import string to use strings in Python. However, if you do import string, which is what we're doing here, we're going to gain access to a couple of utility functions, which are quite handy. Um, the last thing we need to import is fuzzy wuzzy. Now, note that this import that I'm doing here is slightly different. I'm saying from fuzzy wuzzy import fuzz. So these two imports down here, they import everything within the package. This one up here is importing just fuzz from the package. So we're avoiding having to bring in all of the unnecessary things. It's, it's selective imports, which is quite convenient. So this is all of the packages we're going to need. So next what we can do is we can actually go, in, go on and start writing the code for the genetic algorithm. So as an overview at a high level, what a genetic algorithm does is it, it's inspired by biology and evolution. And what it does is it comes up with solutions, not optimal generally, but it comes up with a pretty good solutions towards um, any problem that involves optimization. So if the problem can exhibit some form of partial correctness, then, an, uh, then a genetic algorithm works just fine. Um, for this example, we're going to be using a genetic algorithm to come up with a population of individuals. And what these individuals are going to try to do is they're going to try to match a string that we give it. So in other words, what we're going to do is we're going to have, say, 20 random individuals within this population. And each individual is going to be initialized with a random string. Over time, as generations pass, what's going to happen is we're going to have highly performing individuals which somewhat um, match the input string. Those individuals are going to be chosen to go on to reproduction, and then they're going to be, mo they're going to be moved on to the next generation. And we're going to repeat this as many times as desired. And this is an incredibly simple genetic algorithm. It has no practical use, but it demonstrates um, the use of genetic algorithms, and it also demonstrates, more importantly in this case, uh, various types of things you can do in Python in terms of paradigms. So the first thing we need to do is we need to come up with a representation of an individual. Oftentimes individuals are called agents. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to def define a class. This is obviously taking advantage of object-oriented programming. So I'm going to say class agent. And what this does is it's, it, it's probably exactly what you think it is. It's defining a new class as an agent. Now, in object-oriented programming, what you need to do is you need to oftentimes provide a constructor or some way to initialize in an object. And the way that this is done in Python is with a special method um, called double underscore uh, init double underscore. So I'll say def init, and you can see the linter here in Adam is recommending uh, an autocomplete for init. So I'm going to do this. And any member functions of the class um, start off with self as the first argument. And then for the second argument, you can provide anything you would in a normal constructor. Now, the one thing we need to keep track of here is the length of the string that we're dealing with. So I'm just going to pa pass in something called length at the moment. And what we're going to do then is we're going to have, um, as I mentioned before, each individual is representing a string. So we need to have a string assigned to this object. So I'm going to say self.string. So self.string is indicating that the variable string is a member of uh, agent. I'm going to say this is equals, equal to, I'm going to do double single quotes, which is defining a string, dot join. And then within join, I'm going to say random.choice string dot letters for underscore in x range. Now, if you're not familiar with functional programming, this might be a little um, unfamiliar to you. So there's actually quite a few things going on here. So what we have going on here is we're assigning to a member variable string. And the way that this is done is we are 
referencing the random module, which we've imported up here, and we're calling a function within the random module called choice. And what choice does is it randomly picks an item from a list. And that's exactly what string.letters is. String.letters returns a list of letters uh, for the English alphabet. So you have um, 26 letters. You have, um, I, I, I'm actually not sure if this includes uppercase and lowercase or if it's one or the other. Um, so it's either going to be 26 or 26 times 2 um, is going to be the length of the list that we're dealing with. Um, and then what we're doing is we're going to say, we're going to, so what this is going to do is we're randomly picking a letter, essentially, from the alphabet. That's what this does. But we want to repeat this enough times to match the length. So what we're going to do is we're going to randomly pick a letter out of all of the letters in the alphabet length number of times. And the way that this is done is with what is known as a comprehension notation. Comprehension is something which comes from functional programming. There are list comprehensions, there are dictionary comprehensions in Python. You can do set comprehensions. And the idea is that you can, rather than having a for loop to do all of this, um, involving you know lexical scope and all kinds of um, indentation, this is a very clean, compact way to um, specify something if it's going to be spitting out a list of things. Finally, what the dot join will do is it's going to join all of those um, items in the list together into one string. So we end up getting a random string out of this. So as you can see already, we haven't even written that much code, but we're already mixing paradigms. We have object oriented where we're defining you know a class here, and we also have some functional programming going on with this comprehension here in the middle. So Next thing we need to do is um, have one other member variable of this class, and this is going to be called um, fitness. And fitness is an idea that is um, kind of innate to genetic algorithms. Essentially, when reproduction comes around, we need to have a way to say that one individual is better than another. So what we essentially do is we evaluate the individuals, and then they each get assigned a fitness score those with highest fitness scores are selected to move on to the next generation. And we need a place to store this, which is where it's going to be stored right here. So that's all we really need for the age, and it's actually very straightforward. That's all the code we're going to need for the initialization, at least. Um, this next part that I'm doing right here is completely optional, um, but it does demonstrate um, more special functions, uh, or special methods as they're called. So you might have heard the term special method before. What is a special method? A special method is something um, which is, it's a method under an object like this that starts and ends with a double quote. And what it does is it allows you to alter the behavior of certain functions that work on objects. For instance, when you print an object in Python, it's string method right here, gets called. So whatever is returned from this method is what's gonna be printed. And it's very important sometimes because you don't want to manually have to print every single thing in your code. You want to have it kind of automatically done. So by implementing the string method here, um, we get a very clean representation of what we're, what we're dealing with. This is very similar to using toString in Java. So this is going to be relatively straightforward. I'm just going to say return string. And I'm going to, there's several different ways you can concatenate strings. Uh, this is actually an older um, version of doing this, or an, an older way of doing it. There's actually a better way of doing string concatenation nowadays with a um, with the format function. Uh, the reason I'm not showing it here is because I actually do not have that in my notes right here. So we're just going to have to deal with this. There's nothing wrong with this method. It's just a little bit more verbose. So uh, pretty straightforward, we're just printing out the metadata for each object. We print out the string, the random string that was generated, and then we're printing out the associated fitness. Um, something I forgot to mention, uh, we initialize fitness as negative one to indicate that the evaluation has not taken place yet for an object. So um, you can see here in Adam we're getting some uh, errors here. This is actually just um, pep8, which is um, a kind of a convention for styling Python code. Um, it was kind of com complaining there that it didn't like um, having a single space at once, two spaces, so we'll just give it two spaces. Um, okay, so this is really all of the object-oriented stuff that we're dealing with um, as far as class definitions. 
Next up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys a few things that um, is more related to kind of scripting, and it kind of just shows how um, Python is an interpretive language, and the way that evaluation is done on these um, Python files when they're opened up is done line by line. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to go down here, and we need to we need to store some global data essentially. And you might think global data is dangerous, and it is dangerous, but this is a very simple bare bones example, and it's just convenient doing it this way. Um, now, of course, if you had a larger program, you probably wouldn't want to do it like this. You would probably want to have um, some way to uh, safely store all of this data in a way that is accessible and easy to work with. Um, but again, for what we're doing here, this is going to be sufficient. So this is just a couple of um, things uh, which um, are going to specify to the genetic algorithm how big we want to have our population. So we're, we're going to be dealing with 20 individuals at a time, and we're going to be doing this for a thousand generations. Um, and then we also have some uh, data here representing our input string that we're wanting to target towards and the length of that string as well. Now, of course, all of this stuff, again, can be kept in a better way, but this is just demonstrating that um, that you'll, as you'll see when we actually run this, the stuff is evaluated line by line. Um, the stuff you'd ideally want to store in a config file, most likely. So next up, what we're going to do is we're going to do something a little bit more imperative style. So in Python, you don't have to have functions uh, defined in objects. In fact, you don't have to have objects defined anywhere at all if, if you don't care to. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a function just all by itself, not within a fun uh, not within a um, object or anything. Uh, we're just going to call it GA, standing for gen genetic algorithm. And within GA, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be essentially doing all the code that's necessary in order to um, evolve a um, population of agents towards this uh, string that we've been talking about. So the first thing we need to do is we need to start off initializing a population of agents. So I'm just going to say agents equals init agents. Uh, this is a function that we're going to have to define. It currently does not exist yet. Um, and what this function will do is it's going to return a list of initialized agents. And again, agents are just going to be a bunch of essentially random strings and fitness values. So once we have the agents generated, then what we have to do is we have to go through and we have to perform the three um, primary, um, or I, sh I should say the four primary um, functions of a genetic algorithm. The first of which is we need to uh, determine the fitness of each agent, then we need to select which agents have performed well, and then from there we need to reproduce using two different things, which are known as crossover and mutation. Um, and we need to do this as many times as there are generations. So that's going to indicate that we need a for loop. So I'm going to say for generation in x range of generations. And you can see that this here, generations, is referring to this global variable out here. Um, I think this one's two lines here. Yep. So this is how you de define a for loop here, and this is the more imperative way of doing it. You see up here, we did technically kind of a for loop up here, but this was with a comprehension style, which is more functional in nature. This down here is more imperative in nature. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're just going to do a simple print here, and uh, as you could tell right away, um, if you've been paying attention, we're not calling print as a function. It's a keyword in this case, which means we're actually on Python 2.7. So I'm just going to say, you know, for some for some uh, you know output to the screen, just so we can kind of see the progress of everything. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to print out the generation. That'll be the first thing we do. Next, what I'm going to do is we're going to alter the list of agents which have been initialized. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to call a fitness function, which doesn't exist yet, and we're going to pass it the agents. And then after the fitness has been determined for everything, then we're going to do um, selection on those agents. After selection is done, then we're going to do the uh, two forms 
of functions which are used for reproduction, the first of which is going to be crossover. And finally, mutation. And then we need, as a very last thing, we need to have a way to define a cutoff point. Now, there's different ways you can define a cutoff point, but the way I'm going to define it here, there's going to be two different ways you can do it. You can do it based on the number of generations, or alternatively, you can go until a certain um, agent has reached a certain fitness value. And that's something we're going to play around with. We're going to try out both of them. Um, at least we'll have the code down for both of them. So we'll say if any agent, agent fitness value, exceeds or is equal to 90 um, for each agent in the agents, then what we're going to do is we're going to say print uh, threshold has been met. And then what we'll do is we'll exit. Okay, so the idea behind this is that, hey, we've reached a good enough candidate. It's not the optimal candidate. It's not perfect. It doesn't match the input string completely, but it's good enough. It's 90% close enough, essentially. Um, as you can see in here, we're using another comprehension in here. So this is mixing all of these different styles. We have an imperative loop out here, but on the inside here, we have a comprehension. So I hope the, the, the point, the main point of this video is to kind of illustrate that you can mix and match things willy-nilly. There's nothing wrong with doing that. As long as the code is readable and other people can understand it and you can understand it, there's really nothing wrong with doing this. Um, in fact, oftentimes it's better. Functional code oftentimes is much more concise than imperative code, So, but sometimes you do need imperative code, so you kind of want to mix and match when you can. Um, next up, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be implementing these functions which we specified up here. So uh, the first thing here is um, we need to define um, init agents. So init agents is going to be taking in two things. It's going to be taking in a population and it's going to be taking in a length. And recall that this is going to be generating a list of agents that have been initialized. And if you... Um, if you think hard about it, you don't actually have to do any imperative stuff in here. You can just do pure functional um, programming in here. So we're just going to use a list comprehension. Um, my apologies for all these things, by the way, here, getting in the way. Uh, let's just do this a little bit. Um, so here's what we're going to do. This is going to be very, very straightforward. So I'm going to say return, and we're going to say agent. This here is um, creating a new agent object. And we're going to say length is what gets passed in there. And we're going to say for underscore underscore indicating that we don't really care what this um, value is. We just are using it for uh, iteration purposes. Um, for I don't care in X range population. So what this will do is it's going to generate a number of agents, put them on a list equal to, and the length of that list is going to be equal to the population size. That's literally the entire implementation right there. Very straightforward. Next up, what we're going to do is we're going to implement the fitness function. So I'll say fitness. Um, fitness is going to be slightly more complicated, but really not, not all that much more. Um, I'll say agents is what we're going to be taking in, because you can see we have that specified up here. And what we're, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be altering the um, fitness of uh, the agent based on how well it performs. Now. How are we going to do that? How are we going to determine the fitness of an agent? Well, in this case, going back to the definition of the problem, we are going to be comparing to our original string. And as I mentioned before, we're going to be using fuzzy wuzzy. Fuzzy wuzzy does um, string um, matching, um, fuzzy string matching. So down here, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be determining what the fitness is and then assigning it to the agent. We're going to do that for each agent, and then we're going to return those agents with the updated fitness values. So I'll say for agent in agents. I'm going to say agent.fitness equals fuzz.ratio of agent, the agent version of the string, versus the actual input string. So what this will do is it will basically give us a 
percentage of how close the agent's string is to the input string. And that is going to be considered the fitness of the agent. So last thing we need to do is just return the agents. Okay, next function, we're going to be dealing with uh, selection here. So under selection, we again are going to be passing in agents. And you know all these are all the same. We're passing in agents and returning the agents. And what we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of a couple of built-in functions in Python here. Um, we're going to do agents equals sorted agents key equals lambda agent agent dot fitness reverse equals true. Now this line, there's a lot of good stuff in this line. So the first one is we're taking advantage of a built-in sort function. And the way that the sort function works is it takes in a list of items and it takes in a function that will basically order um, it, it's, it, it is a way that you can define order amongst whatever it is that you're going to be sorting. So in this case, we're going to be using a lambda, which is a functional programming um, thing, and we're going to be using it to define an anonymous function, which takes in an agent and returns the agent fitness value. And then what the sorted function will do is it's going to use this anonymous function to investigate the list of agents and sort them by their um, fitness values. Uh, something to mention though is um, sorted does it from smallest to largest. We want the largest to smallest. So we pass it this other thing here which reverses the list. So then what we're going to do is we're just going to say I'm just going to say print a new line and then what we're going to do is we're going to join mapping string over agents. This is a, yet another functional um, programming uh, kind of idea here, which is this idea of mapping. So functions in Python are first class. What does that mean? That means that they can be assigned to variables, they can be passed into functions and returned from functions. Uh, this is something that you cannot do in some programming languages such as uh, Java. I don't believe you can do this in Java. Uh, this is very powerful. Essentially what we're doing is we're, for, for each agent, we're going to be applying the string function to it, which is going to return the string representation of each agent. Then what we're going to do is we're going to join those all together um, in between new lines. So essentially what's going to happen is we're going to be printing all the agents out. And recall that we've defined this special method up here for um, printing out an agent. So what we'll ultimately be getting is a list for each agent with a print like this. Very convenient. Uh, finally, what we'll be doing is um, we, we've sorted the agents, but we have not taken the agents that we want for reproduction. So we need to do that. So what I'm going to be using here is another useful thing that Python offers, which is what is known as array slicing. And what array slicing does is it will essentially take um, you see this colon right here, what it does is it will take part of an array, or rather part of a list, and based on the way that you place the, the colon and what you have on the left and right hand side of it, it will automatically um, take certain elements from either the front or end of the list, which is um, quite useful. So in this case, this is just going to be taking the top 20% of the individuals. Recall that our population size is 20 here. So that means we should be getting about, what is that, four agents? If you do 0.2 times 20, so we should be getting about four agents um, uh, out of this selection here. The four best performing individuals are going to be moving on uh, for reproduction. So next up here, we have a bit of a complicated function. Uh, it's crossover. So crossover, what it does is it takes to, um, well, it's going to take all the agents, but what it does is it takes pairs of agents uh, that, have, that have been passed in, that have been selected, and it will randomly recombine parts of them in order to hopefully make a better outcome. And um, the way we're going to do this here is 
we're going to define an empty list here called offspring. And I got quite a bit of code here I need to actually put in. This is actually the largest um, function here. So let me actually just put this code in real quick. And then we can discuss it here. Um, the thing about genetic algorithms is, depending on the language um, that, we're, that you're implementing it in, it can either be very concise um, or it can be very um, kind of verbose, the actual um, implementation. And it turns out that for doing crossover, uh, crossover is quite difficult to concisely describe in, in most languages, actually, depending on the type of crossover you're doing. Um, by no means is this the best way of doing it. This is just um, a way that you can do it. Um, for those of you who are somewhat familiar with genetic algorithms, um, prior to me talking about them here, you might see that we have um, the, the possibility of selecting the same parent twice. Um, I'm aware of that, but for the purposes of this simple presentation, we're not going to be really concerned with that. So the idea behind this is that we're going to be taking, like I said, we're going to be iterating over the list of agents. We're going to be taking, and, and these are the selected agents, we're going to be taking two agents um, at a time, and we're going to be taking bits and pieces um, of those agents to form children. And uh, the way we're going to do that here is we're going to be doing lots and lots and lots of array slicing. So what this is doing here, what I'm typing right now, is this is actually taking the first part of the first uh, parent and it's going to be combining it with the second part of the second parent. And as you can see, split was actually um, determined completely randomly. Um, that's actually how genetic algorithms, I hope you're getting the idea now, they are very randomized. Uh, two same runs of a genetic algorithm are almost guaranteed never going to produce the exact same output. Um, and some people um, kind of get scared by, the, by this idea of non-deterministic uh, results, non-deterministic execution. But it turns out that this is actually kind of what, um, what genetic algorithms are based upon. You want to have that randomness. Uh, the, the whole idea is that you don't have to be the best of the best to survive, it's just you have to be good enough. So we've generated the children here, and we're just going to be appending the children um, uh, to the offspring here. And again, apologies for this, this is kind of mundane coding here, but that's what you get when you're doing kind of a coding demo here. Uh, you'll see we're, we're calling agent.extend offspring. What agent of uh, what extend does is it will extend um, a list with another list, essentially. You could kind of concatenate two lists with it. Um, there's nothing actually too interesting in this implementation of crossover um, other than the array slicing. So, again, to go over it, what we're doing is for each pair, which are randomly selected here, um, or there's the randomly selected right here. What we're doing is we're going to we're, we're going to fill in the rest of the population. We've killed off a part of the population. We need to repopulate that area. So what we do is for each slot there, what we're doing is we're taking two parents randomly, and then we're going to make two children. So we have some object-oriented stuff going on here as well. And then what we do is we determine a random split location within the string, and we are going to be um, recombining each parent, um, each part of each parent, rather, to come up with two children. So, for instance, the first child here is the first part of parent one string matched with um, part two of parent two string, and vice versa for child two. And um, what this is doing is it's, it's generating two ch um, children per iteration. Then what we do is we add those offspring, which have been generated onto the agents, and we're basically good to go to the next generation. Um, however, there's actually one other little function we need to um, implement here, and that is um, mutation. So the way that mutation works is, the, the whole idea behind mutation is that 
crossover generally isn't enough. It doesn't give you enough diversity. You kind of end up um, converging on a um, set of solutions, and it's very um, not desirable at all to have that. Um, you don't want to be. You want to be able to explore the search space to some degree. Um, and pure crossover does not allow for um, enough exploration. So we actually have to add on. Um, a mutation method which will kind of randomly protrude or protrude each um, each string just slightly. It'll, it'll make slight changes to each string. So what we're going to do here is we're going to be for each agent we're going to be picking a random index and then the parameter of that index and I'm going to be determining whether or not we want to actually mutates. Mutation isn't something that's guaranteed to happen, it's something that can happen. So we'll say a 10% chance of mutation here. So if mutation uh, is something that something that is going to occur, you know, if it's the 10% chance, if it happens, then what we're going to do is we're going to say agent.string equals agent.string 0 to index plus random dot choice and again I apologize this is kind of just somewhat boring code here but I'll go over this and tell you all the ins and outs of it here in just a moment there's more um, array slicing going on here as you can see um, oops one little thing here there we go um, the array slicing is very very powerful if you get to use it properly. Okay, so let's talk about what we got going on here. So to mutate these agents we need to loop over each one. That's what this is doing. Then what we need to do is we need to enumerate over each letter within the string and we need to determine whether or not we want to mutate it. That's what this does. If we are going to mutate it, the way we're going to do that is we're going to keep the string the same up to that letter, and then we're going to choose a new random letter for that location, and then we're going to save the rest of the string as it was. So what this does here is it takes up to the index that was chosen, but not including the index. This here takes after the index to the, to the end of the string, and that just leaves the middle part here, which is the um, randomly chosen letter. Now plus here um, is just string concatenation, and then we're just assigning it back to the string here. Pretty straightforward stuff. We are almost done. The last thing we need to do is essentially um, actually call this code. Now, if you wanted to, you don't actually have to define a main method because Python evaluates line by line. So if you really wanted to, you don't actually have to define a main method, although I believe it's good practice too. It's very good for readability's sake. It makes it less of a script and more of a actual program. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say under, un, underscore underscore name this is a special variable. This is um, on. This is referring to the module that we're in. So this it might seem a little confusing, but this variable here underscore underscore name actually exists. We're not. We haven't defined it because it is already automatically defined. It's referring to the file itself. So we're saying if the name here underscore underscore main depends on how you call it, That's it'll affect the, the, the name here is going to depend on how it's um, depend on how it's called. We'll say in string, and I'm just going to, for an example, I'm just going to use my name here. I'm going to say Frosquachi. So this is the target string that we're wanting to deal with, and the length of that string is going to be, well, very simply, just the length of that string. So we just use the built-in len function to determine the length of a string. Len is very convenient. It can actually um, it can determine the length of strings. It can determine the length of lists, lists, dictionaries, and even objects if you implement um, the special method that the length object will be calling when it is iterating over um, whatever enumerable object that you're dealing with. And then the very last thing we need to do is we need to call ga. This is literally it right here. So let's go over the program real quick, just one more time, and then we'll go ahead and give it a run here and then wrap it up. So the idea here is that we have defined a, a genetic algorithm. What's going to happen is it's going to 
be the goal of the genetic algorithm is to recreate this string here. And each agent, we're going to be defining 20 agents as our population, and we're going to be going for up to a thousand generations if we wanted to, but in this case we're actually using a different metric here. We're going to be using this instead, which is if any agent reaches 90% fitness, um, then we're going to terminate. And the way that this is accomplished is by using you know, some object-oriented programming where we define an agent here. We see there's um, lots of functional programming kind of um, dashed in here and there. Um, and then there is um, other special Python things, such as being able to iterate over two variables at once here. We have lots of um, array slicing going on, and we have just functions that are not defined within objects. There's a lot of things here, which again, if you are not familiar with Python, this might be a little confusing. Um, but again, what's going to happen, we're going we're gonna to get 20 agents, and um, each is going to be initialized with a random string. What we do is we use fuzzy wuzzy down here to determine how well that random string matches the input string down here. If it matches it pretty well, the agent is going to get a higher fitness value. What we then do is we will be um, using our selection method to, to determine which agents have per are performing the best. We select those ones, then we do some crossover and mutation to come up with some offspring, and then just repeat the process until this threshold is met. So. Let's go ahead and give this code a run. Um, you could do this if you wanted to directly in Atom. Um, I'm not going to do it directly in Atom, though. Um, we can actually, let me try. We could try with something in Atom. Let's say um, run here. I, I have a feeling this is not going to work. It's been a while since I've done it here. Um, yeah, we have a slight issue here. Um, none type no length. Okay, so we do have a small issue in the program here, which I will take a look at here. It does look like it's actually executing in Atom, though. So I will probably end up um, pausing the video here and then resuming it after I have determined what is wrong, and we can go from there. Hey, guys, sorry about that. I just forgot to add um, a return statement on the selection method, which ended up causing... Um, uh, essentially just an exception to be thrown at runtime. So it should work now. So let's go ahead and actually run this for real. Um, before I do, I kind of want to show some of the output from the failure. Actually, this is maybe a little bit useful. So what we see here is we see 20 agents which have been printed here, which is what I'm highlighting right now. And all 20 of these things uh, have already been, the, their fitness values have been generated and they've been selected, which means that they have been, uh, or not, not selected rather, but they've been ordered um, for selection. That's when the error was occurring. Um, but you can kind of see here that these are all totally random strings. They don't even closely resemble um, my name down here, Troy Squalachi. But some of them are actually a little bit closer than others. Like if you look at this one down here, this one starts with a capital T. And it somewhat resembles Troy Squalachi, but not quite. So let's go ahead and run this for real, and let's see how long it takes, or if it even reaches 90%. Because this is actually a pretty big search space. So I'm going to say run again. Um, and run outside of function. Let's see. Oh, sorry about that. Let's do it here. Run. There we go. All right. It looks like it finished here. So, oh, we actually have met the, the threshold of 999. So it turns out that a thousand generations is not long enough for random strings to converge onto a solution with at least 90%. So if we scroll up here a little bit, we can see, like at generation 993, we've already converged on this string here. Toy squid. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, but you can, if you look at that, it kind of resembles our input string down here, right? So, again, this is um, this is very, uh, the, the whole idea behind genetic algorithms is it doesn't, again, it's not going to be good enough oftentimes. You're not guaranteed going to um, actually get an optimal solution, and in this case, we actually didn't get a solution matching our 90% requirement. We terminated at... 1,000 um, generations instead. Uh, something else with genetic algorithms, uh, just a minor note with them, is that they tend to 
um, if, if, if handled improperly, which they are in this case, they could all kind of converge onto the same solution, which is very bad if that happens. Um, you could kind of see we don't make a whole lot of progress then from generation to generation. Um, but again, this uh, whole demo here is not really on genetic algorithms, uh, it's on Python. So I hope you learned um, some stuff about Python. Um, mainly, again, this video was about the paradigms, how you can mix and match things, and it kind of demonstrated some of the built-in features of Python, which are things that you're likely not going to see in other programming languages. So if you find this video helpful um, and are more interested in genetic algorithms or Python in general, if you find yourself having more questions or are curious about different things, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. My email is uh, troysquilacci at gmail.com. Um, thanks for watching, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and have a nice day.